Hey there friends and welcome to Pro Tools Answers where three certified Pro Tools experts and Avid instructors discuss, demonstrate and elaborate on your Pro Tools questions put to the community in the official Avid Facebook support forum. I am your host Dave Phillips, audio engineer and lecturer based in the UK and on today's episode we'll be answering a question from Craig and using it as a bit of a springboard into a discussion about one of our favourite modern Pro Tools tools, 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 Elastic Audio. Now Craig asks... I just accidentally discovered that the warp track is a thing and it's just what I need for a project I'm working on. How I went all these how I went all these years without knowing about it, I don't know. But none of the helpful tutorials I find online tell me what to do for this situation where the warp track is greyed out. What's the magic I'm missing? And with me to answer Craig's questions are two legends in the Pro Tools community. Say hola to the indispensable Anders Motz at Tonkraftwerk in Austria. Hello. And Avid's audio curriculum manager in Tokyo, the indomitable Mr. Andy Hagerman. Hola, como esta bien? <laughs> <laughs> oh, the, the world's leading multilingual Pro Tools podcast. Uh, <laughs> Before I start, I just want to give a shout out to our Patreon supporters who generously support us each month. Many thanks to our buddies Mike, Gregor and Matthew. And we have to say welcome to our new Patreon, Don. Welcome, Don. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it, it's so much appreciated, we can't even tell you. Uh, and if you guys are benefiting from what we're doing each week and would like to support the show, we'd be very grateful uh, to you to head over to patreon.com forward slash Pro Tools Answers, uh, where you can see the various Patreon levels of support and help keep Pro Tools Answers churning out the right answers. And hopefully we're going to be doing that right now. So let's delve into Elastic Audio. So the first thing I think to answer uh, Craig's question mm -hmm. is just to just to you know call things by their proper terms. Elastic audio is the feature, and um, elastic audio can be warped. That's what the whole point of it is: mm -hmm. um, is to be able to stretch it in a way that is different from, for example, the TCE trim tool, and that can happen on any audio track. So the features elastic audio, the kind of track that it's on, is an audio track. There's no mm -hmm. such thing as a warp track per se, right. but any audio track can be warped via elastic audio. Mm -hmm. And the way that we'll get to that, and he's found this, is through the warp view in the, the track selector, the track view selector, which is this drop-down box where we see the, the automation, um, we'll see the, the, the plug-in automation, we can see playlists. And these two that are grayed out here are the elastic audio modes. And the reason that they're grayed out is because elastic audio isn't active on the track. So we can't do any stretching, we can't do any warping, uh, we can't do any contracting. Um, we have to activate that. And the plugins uh, for Elastic Audio are enabled right here. So we'll click on those and we'll select one of the four Elastic Audio modes. And we're just going to look at polyphonic and monophonic today. Is that, I think that's right, isn't it? Yeah, and yeah, then let's do that. Next week we're going to look at rhythmic and vary speed. So, and maybe X-Form as well, which is the fifth Elastic Audio plugin indeed so to enable elastic audio on the track we're just going to select one of the plugins and i've got these two uh, rhythm guitar tracks uh connected together uh, via a group so if i enable elastic audio on one the same thing will happen on the other and from this point the warp view becomes available and analysis view becomes uh, available so let's just have a quick look at what these two are all about D dave let me just just stop real quickly um mm -hmm. you chose polyphonic as as your your go-to and i do the same thing by the yes. way when i'm when i'm doing something um why did you choose polyphonic versus monophonic okay so i'm working this is an electric guitar piece so it's it's harmonically complex um it's chord based and the monophonic plugin is it's kind of like the catch-all plugin i think we refer to it as isn't it it, it can work on pretty much all of the material um and, and do a relatively good job with most types of material, correct? Polyphonic, you mean, right? Polyphonic, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So hence why looking at polyphonic first. You know, the, the, the alternative one is the, the monophonic plugin. Um, and typically we'll use that for monophonic instruments, you know, single note instruments, saxophones, flutes, um, Andy singing, um, bass guitars. <clears throat> that kind of thing i do do that i do do the gregorian chant 
where I can actually do the the multiphonics. So that would then go to the polyphonic mode. Indeed. Okay. Well, in in that case, we'll stick with polyphonic. There we go. Yes. Good choice. So strange show. <laughs> <laughs> So yes, looking at analysis view, what analysis view will do is when we switch to that, it will show you all of the, the transient events that Pro Tools detects and applies a, uh, a, a, a transient, are they transient markers? They're called event markers. Event markers, that's the one. Mm -hmm. It's very early on a Monday morning and I got home very late. Nice. So this is, where, this is where, before we go into do any Elastic Audio editing, we can just have a look and see all of the events that, that Pro Tools is going to apply uh, Elastic Audio uh, stretching to. If we were choosing to do this automatically, because let's just step back a second. If we go into Warp View, we can triple click the whole clip right there. And if I open up our uh, quantizing window I can apply a quantize to the entire thing and what Pro Tools will do it will look at all of the the, uh, the, the the event markers and it will quantize all of the event markers but we're not going to want that because what's going to happen if we look at these three little event markers right here um, I'm not sure they're actually attached to anything any specific transient event that I want so we're going to get some unnecessary warping right there and I, I think it's fair to say that with warping any kind of audio, we want to do as little as possible. Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> we want so, so what's your go? How, how do you get rid of those unwanted uh, event markers? Well, there's a couple of ways. That the manual way of doing it is, it. it I, I think I'm right in going over to analysis view, holding down the Alt key, mm -hmm. and with the selector tool. I don't think yes it, it has to be the selector tool i'm working in tool. Uh, in smart tool mode at the moment the grabber, grabber tool, tool. in the grabber tool yeah hold down alt it'll bring up the minus key and i can get rid of any of the transient markers that i uh, the the event markers sorry that i don't want pro tools to apply um any quantizing to sounds like a lot of work for a long track is there any other way so we can also with our clip selected, and I think the it's one entire clip, we'll head up to event, open up, uh, no, it's clip, isn't it? Sorry, elastic properties, because it's a clip, it's a clip based process. Open the, the elastic properties window, and then we've got our uh, event sensitivity menu right here. So we can drop down the, the event sensitivity, and it will drop out all of the well, it will drop out a lot of events, really. We can see that it's, it's getting rid of a lot of them right here. So For folks who have ever used Beat Detective before, this is similar in workflow to beat markers in Beat Detective, right? So, yeah. so this is this is 100% a way to, to, to get into, mm -hmm. um, you know, to get rid of the ones that you know are extraneous. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the word, the, the extraneous events that you don't want. And I have to admit, for me, I, I tend to just go in manually and do it because I can spend ages trying to get the right thing and then having to go through it anyway to get rid of the markers that because it, it will inevitably remove too many markers or it will inevitably not remove enough. So my, my preference actually is to go through and do it manually. How about you guys? I, I usually I usually walk it down till till it's not quite catching all of them. Hmm. So, so for example, I would bring it down in your case, maybe to keep it bringing down, 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 down there to maybe, maybe just above there. Right. So there's a couple. So there's one, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, the seventh one in is probably not needed. Yeah. So at that point, I'm just getting rid of the, those kind of the stragglers, but I've let event sensitivity, um, kind of do the, most of the lifting for me, just mm -hmm. reduces some clicks. But I, I, I wouldn't uh, rely totally on vision here. I would totally play this thing back because like if you're looking uh, somewhere uh, just below the elastic properties uh, window that you have floating up, up there, there are some uh, transients there that might be something that should make important Always, that yes. should be yep. quantized, I'll, but I'll also it track. might not be. So, so don't rely uh, only on visuals here. Uh, try to to listen to the material and and see what what you wanted to to catch. 
football. And by the way, absolutely. You, you'll also find that very often, especially with spoken word and things like that, that um, that there are places where it's not marked, right? And and it's mm-hmm. not a matter of removing what you don't want. You actually have to add something that Pro Tools just cannot on its own detect. Mm-hmm. And in that case, you just use the grabber tool and just go ahead and click wherever you want a, uh, a an event marker to be put. Mm-hmm. Well, this is the thing that I'm getting to, because if I if I remove too many of them, that that's actually a transient that I want to work on. But if I bring it down one more step, yeah, it's it's not removing those, but it is removing that one. Right. Okay. Can you play so, that back so just we can hear uh, how <clears throat> it sounds? Yarp. So there's a couple that that, that transient there is a as an important one that I'm mm-hmm. after. Okay. Yep. But the, the the reason that I will I want to work on it manually rather than rely on the event sensitivity is because I'd rather be taking these away than, as Andy said, manually inserting yeah. them. Because yeah. you have to make sure you're right in the right place or else yeah. it'll not quite work mm-hmm. for you. And I really, I, I want Pro Tools to be detecting my transients. I don't yeah. want to be doing that manually. So hence why I'll, I'll be doing, I'll be working in that way. I, I prefer for me to be making the decisions rather than Pro Tools making those decisions for me. So just just spending sort of five minutes going through a track, having a listen, removing the event markers that you don't want Pro Tools to, to, to quantize, that that would be my preference. But obviously everybody's different and every song is different. Um, every scenario is different. So we're just kind of laying down ideas and ground rules, I suppose, at the moment, aren't we? You can also, you can also by the way, use the selector tool and just select an area and hit delete. You're not wrong. Which is sometimes a little bit easier than mm-hmm. than you know finding exactly the line and clicking on it with the grabber tool. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So all all of these events they they respond to typical editing uh, mm-hmm. uh, controls, don't they? Obviously not the trim tool, <laughs> but you know, select a tool, delete, etc. So so Dave, why do you why do you spend your time to do this? Well, cause this this is all about quantizing. Uh, audio and making it a little bit tighter with my recording so this this particular guitar uh, there were some parts of it actually I don't think it was this specific guitar part it was the chorus um, guitar that I was going to be looking at specifically because there are some lazy parts in here that just don't sit right with me in the track so we I would be analyzing I'll, I'll stick these into the correct elastic audio mode which they already are actually and I'll switch over to analysis view. We'll get rid of a few things here. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to highlight this section here and we're just going to do this automatically. So now I've I've created a little bit of a rule basis for Pro Tools. Now these are just the uh, uh, the transients that Pro Tools is going to quantize for me. I'm going to highlight those. I'm going to press Alt and Zero and that's going to open up my event operations window. And because I have Elastic Audio enabled and because I've got uh, Elastic Audio events selected, the, the event operations window is going to be focusing on Elastic Audio events rather than uh, the, the, the MIDI clips that if we didn't have audio selected, if we had MIDI selected, um, it would be giving us the option to quantize note on and note off events, etc. But because we have Elastic Audio enabled, we've selected Elastic Audio, the event operations window is going to be quantizing Elastic Audio events and essentially treating these as MIDI events. That's the way that I like That's to exactly think of right. them. Yeah. Yep. So from there, we can just keep it simple. Um, I'm going to just bring the timing down because I don't want it to be robotic. I just want to bring these a little bit closer in. Um, duh, 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 I think the 16th notes base. So I'm going to make my selection, make sure apply is highlighted. And then I'm going to click apply and it's moved my notes, my tra- uh, my events a little bit closer to the grid as you would expect uh, that to happen with, um, uh, with quantizing. The thing is what you may have noticed though is that uh, uh, all of the notes that I didn't select on the right hand side also moved the entire track also moved and this is one of the complexities with elastic audio isn't it because you have to anchor certain parts of the uh, of, of the, the track down to the timeline in order for it to not move otherwise that just moving that thing there will make all of them move but if we anchor 
um, by holding down control for me and then just clicking we can oh, no I have to do it the other way <coughs> as well we can make sure that all of the clips to the left and the right hand side are not going to move so if I make that adjustment there everything move to the right again as well I'm messing this up aren't I <clears throat> what have I done wrong go, go, ahead, go ahead and try it again so it's just applying that hitting apply it's still moving things to the right hand side I was are you no, sure it did. yeah it, it did didn't. It's it's moving um, that stuff there. Go ahead and try that one more. Undo it one more time. Oh no, no. Okay, it did. <clears throat> yeah. It it did, but after it did, after, but it wasn't. But then you fixed it. I think what I done was I was selecting <laughs> that one there as well. So it was quantizing that mm -hmm. and moving right. that too. So it will make some adjustments. Okay. So as long as I've not got that one selected. Now. Maybe. And this is an important distinction because um, what Dave has jumped from is analysis view, analysis view into warp view. Um, analysis view is where you see event markers. And event markers are, and I think Dave, you said it exactly the way that I usually say it, the way that I'm sure Andrew says it, is event markers are to audio as MIDI notes note start is to MIDI, mm -hmm. right? So when you're quantizing and you're elastic audio, you're quantizing the event markers, which is why you were doing that work to get rid of all the extraneous ones. Mm -hmm. However, you, when you move an event marker, it isn't warping the audio, right? When you quantized, what happened is it took those event markers and then promoted them to be warp markers. And once mm -hmm. you do move warp markers, which you can see right here, that's when you are stretching and compressing mm -hmm. the audio. Warping audio, right? It's a great word for it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so let's look at the differences here on Dave's screen where the top two tracks are in analysis mode where you mm -hmm. can see the event markers and which are the straight lines that don't quite go up to the, to the top and bottom of the track. There's like a, a millimeter or a couple of pixels that are left out. Mm -hmm. But if we look on the warp markers in the bottom two tracks, they are also straight white lines, of course, uh, but they have this little warping icon at the bottom, the, the little triangle there. And that's the indicator of a warp marker, which is uh, incidentally the, the, the elastic audio plugin selector button has the same a little yep, uh, right symbol there. there. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's worth mentioning, too, that on those bottom two tracks, even though he is in warp view, you can still see kind of more more grayed out. You can still see where your analysis, or sorry, where your event markers are. So mm -hmm. right after that selected area, all of those event markers are still there for visual cues, right? Mm -hmm. But at, at, if you wanted to uh, move those, he would have to obviously then be in analysis view and it wouldn't warp the audio so there's two different views for do two different kinds of things yes and we we can still do pretty much all of the same things in warp view that we can do in an in analysis view can't we uh, analysis view is just a, a, a allowing it just shows us where the event markers are and we can add them and we can take them away um but we can't actually do any warping as such that's right that's where and the warp vice view versa appears. if you're in warp view you can't move any um, any event markers without first converting them into a warp marker That's and right. moving that. And that will stretch all of the audio around it. So, yeah. uh, so uh, Dave, so let me just double like, click exactly. those. Stop, stop yeah. for a second, um, uh, Dave. So, uh, can you remove the two latest one that ones that you put in, mm -hmm. please? Okay. So, so for instance, if we have that big little uh, note in the middle there, just to the left of, of exactly, I yeah. want to move that, mm -hmm. but I don't want to move anything that's surrounding this. And as Dave said before, you need to anchor the other notes. So, because any warping you do here will time stretch everything. Mm -hmm. So, so we can use warp markers as like pins in a rubber band or mm -hmm. as an anchor in time. So if you do the 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 the, uh, the the event marker to the left and to the right of this event, mm -hmm. exactly this one, if you click yeah. on that one and just turn it into a warp marker. So those two will now act as pins in time, which will not get warped. Mm -hmm. And as Dave now grabs that event markers, Pro, Pro Tools will stretch that point in time, like moving mm -hmm. it and and of course, since we have the two additional warp markers to the left and right, 
those are the points in time that will not stretch anymore. Can I share you my Star Wars shortcut? <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay, so so go ahead and uh, get rid of those three uh, warp markers. Great. Now hold down the shift key mm -hmm. and and go ahead and move your cursor to the beginning of the note. Yeah. You'll see that it looks like a little tiny TIE fighter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now what that will do is when you click, don't click it yet, but what will happen when you click it, it will create a warp marker there, also before it, and also after it in one click. Yeah, allowing maybe. you, and then at that point, you can move that note without having, it just cuts out a couple of clicks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Very the cool. TIE Fighter is a great um, uh, shortcut to know. <laughs> um, uh, so what happens if you if you don't anchor uh, anything? So now we're, we, we don't have an anchor to the to the right here. Um, what, what, what happens if Dave starts pulling one of the warp markers here? Well, crikey, we can cause ourselves a whole world of hurt. So I'm just going to anchor. I'm just going to anchor that one right there, and look what happens to everything to the right. That's the trouble that I was having with this selection here, mm. is I was quantizing that one there, and that was moving everything to the right hand side of it. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. It's it's you, you. You guys both mentioned it just the right way. Is it? It can be either a stretch or it can be an anchor and you you mm -hmm. need to basically make sure that you take care of your workflow mm -hmm. or else the detail will come back and bite you yeah uh, can i grab the screen for a second there uh, we can i just want to show one more thing anders yep, if that's sure. okay one, one yeah, thing sure. that i'll do sure, is sure. when i'm when i want to stretch an individual note rather rather than do what what andy was suggesting uh, which was select create or, or having the anchoring the two uh, markers to the left and right of the note what i might do is I might zoom in because I might not want to stretch that that note either. So That's I right. might go in. I might just hold down Control and add a little marker at the end of the note nice. and between the beginning of the other one and there as well. So I'm not affecting either of the other two notes. We have to bear in mind though when the uh, uh, when the track turns red, that means that the the audio integrity is break basically broken. It's, so it, so yeah. So so this don't. Don't read but, too much into that, by the way. That simply says that it is beyond the intended use mm -hmm. for elastic audio. Yeah. Now, one of the things that, that I'll do a lot of times, uh, and I don't know, I don't know if I'm insane to do it, but it works fairly well for me. But a lot of times, when when I get like dialogue and there's like little, there's there's like mouth noise or something like that, mm -hmm. I I will sometimes create a warp marker just before it, warp marker just after it, mm -hmm. and then just squish it. And it goes away, and it it's, it it does it without any drop. And will I see it go red? Yeah, it'll go red because it's not mm. intended to crush it by that much. But it works completely fine. So you know, always let your ears be your ultimate guide here. Yeah, indeed. that's a great uh, tip, Andy. I'll 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 try that. Oh, dude, it works. Nice. Well, of course, you have to make sure that you anchor it, or else you can, yeah, you yeah, can stretch sure. it. But yeah. let, you know, I've got a word here, and I've got another word here, and at the end, somebody smacks, and you just do this. Oh, it works out great. Oh mm. wow, I I need to try that. <laughs> that's cool. Thanks. So the, yeah, the, this um, these two notes here might be a better way to describe it, actually, rather than I'll, I'll do something like that. <clears throat> so I'm not affecting either of the two notes to the sides of it. So another thing, by the way, is um, are you guys familiar? I'm going to go deep into psychoacoustics. Are you guys familiar with the cut bell experiments? No. No. Okay, so this is back, I think it was in the 70s. We actually could be long, longer ago than that. But this was a psychoacoustic experiment where, um, I, I want to say it was somebody French. I don't know. Honestly, I, I'd have to go back and go, go to my research. Mm. Basically, got rid of the beginning of a note and only played after the initial transient for people and people could not tell the difference. So the end of a saxophone and mm -hmm. the end of a tuba and the end of a trombone or the end of a bell would sound roughly the same. Mm -hmm. So we get a lot of our cues, our sonic cues from the beginning of a musical note, specifically, mm -hmm. I mean, for all sound, but but this was a musical kind of thing. And so what I'll do sometimes when I, when I have the time and the budget to do it mm -hmm. is I will stretch the tail of a note longer than I will stretch the attack because as, as you stretch the attack and if you stretch drums, anybody who stretched drums too much will know that it, it stops sounding natural. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I will do every once in a while is I'll add in 
another so I'll have my my warp marker at the beginning of the note and mm -hmm. then I'll have one where you can see the 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 tail just come on and I will I will stretch the tail to get the duration that I want but I'll try to leave the attack as as unmolested as possible and that gives me a little bit more clarity oh that's that's a cool uh, workflow mm. Uh, now that you mentioned that experiment, I, I, I didn't know it had a name, uh, but I've heard about it before. They talked about it in, in the acoustics class at, at the Royal College of Music. Uh, yeah, great. great. Um, I just grabbed control over the screen here. So I have a little, um, a little clip here, which has been warped, but it's mainly just time stretched to, to fit the tempo. Mm -hmm. and I can see that up in the right hand corner where there is a warp marker here. So that only appears once you've done some warping to the clip, even mm -hmm. though Elastic Audio is enabled, but as long as you haven't warped anything, it will not show up. But now you can clearly see I have warped here. So it's um, adapted to, to the tempo. So I just wanted to show a couple of different ways to warp clips. And why I'm showing this is because yeah, these are things that might happen to you and you need to understand why they're happening and 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 how they are happening so the first thing i'll do i'll just grab a, a note here in the middle and um, and just promote it to a warp marker i tried to do that i tried to grab it but as soon as i clip clicked it i don't know if any of you noticed but protos automatically adds a warp marker mm -hmm. in the beginning of the clip so that's something it just did to anchor that into position. I'll, I'll do it again. So I'll undo and watch here. There is no warp marker here. So I just undid what I did. And I'm clicking here once and it automatically adds that's a warp a marker point. in the beginning, which is good because now I can can start, start dragging here, mm. but it's it might not be the stuff that I want. So I, I'll show... Uh, another way of doing this, and that's to, if I remove this now by hand, and I'll, uh, so, sorry, I had to actually double click this one to, to make it into a warp marker first, and then remove this. Again, I'm holding option to, to remove this marker. And now I have a single warp marker, which is in, is in, the, in the middle of a clip. It could be anywhere, but it's not in the beginning or the end. And now, if I grab hold of the clip, I can actually stretch it on both sides of the warp marker. I remember what I said before, warp marker is like a pin in the, in the timeline where it's nailed to the ground. And here you can see I'm stretching the rubber band in both directions. And this is the operation that only works if you have a single warp marker in a clip. So, you remember from, from the start here when I clicked here and I got uh, automatically a warp marker in the middle, uh, or in the beginning, sorry. And then I, if I would try to do the same here while having that warp marker here, it will not do the operation that I wanted to do. It will, it will simply not work. So it will always stretch around this little pin here and that's uh, important to know. I, though I do I try not to stretch things or compress things too much I do use exactly that workflow sometimes to to take pieces of music that are supposed to hit at a place in video so for example mm -hmm. let's say there was a place in in your, your music there that was the place where the the scene changes and it yeah. was that place that that needs to to be and mm -hmm. it needs to, to stretch on either end that's a great way to do it um, again you have to be very careful about how how much you go and, and mm -hmm. I would probably use a different algorithm, which we'll talk about X form uh, on the next episode, but um, but yeah, that's those those are great workflows for for music and for post. Yeah, but but to be to be really honest, this one has very limited use. Uh, the the accordion warp they call it, where they where you warp on mm -hmm. both sides of of one warp marker. Mm -hmm. A more common uh, uh, thing to do is to have two warp markers. So I'll promote mm -hmm. another warp marker here. And let's say I wanted to extend the end of this so I can just make that longer. And that's possible now because I have two warp markers. So they're both anchored in time. And this guy can then travel along the way. So if we, I listen to this now, let me just zoom. Oh, sorry, messing up the keyboard shortcuts here. So if we listen to this right now, I'll play this clip back here.
And as you can hear, it sounds totally rubbish because I've time stretched this quite a lot. Yeah. Um, but that's the, the idea of, of making something shorter or longer. Let's try it this way instead. Maybe this will work better. I'll I'll be honest. Drums and me don't get along with with elastic audio. I would I'm I'm more of a beat detective guy with this because what you see right here is 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 one of those things. It, it just stretching or compressing drums too much it yeah. starts to to get rid of the reality of it. Um. So um, uh, you're absolutely right here, and uh, and maybe it's um, uh, bringing drums into the program right here wasn't the the best choice here, but uh, uh, one it's a good example. Uh, but one thing, one more thing that you can do, if you have two uh, or more warp markers like this, you can then grab a middle point and and warp around that. That's the exact same uh, thing mm -hmm. as, as Dave was showing before, where we ha have anchored on both sides of the part that I want to stretch. And this is also something that I use quite a lot in when I'm fitting ADR to mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. to um, to film is I'll watch the lips uh, or, and make fine adjustments of of P's and B's and stuff like that. And I'll drag you know I have, and watch the screen. I have exactly an example that shows that. Oh. Can I jump in? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. So so, so one of the things that, um, that you should be aware of is that um, Elastic Audio was initially conceived by us here at Avid as, as a music tool. Right. And, and Dave, and both of you have shown it really well in, in terms of quantizing audio as if it was MIDI. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, so you can line up all that stuff. It's great. It's great. It's great music thing. By the way, I don't, I don't know if you noticed this, but when Dave was quantizing, he was quantizing audio on a sample based track. So tracks do not have to be tick based in order to to do this workflow, which is common. Mis it doesn't hurt if they're 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 uh, they're tick based, but they don't have to be. Um, however, for me, one of the unsung heroes, I already told you how I, I, I'll take dialogue and I'll, I'll basically elastic audio out the, you know, some of the mouth sounds, but mm -hmm. it's great for ADR. Um, so here's a demo session that we've used for forever. Um, and so I'll show my screen here. Okay, so where's my, hold on a second, let me, let me unshare and make sure I'm sharing with my audio. One more, one second here. I think I've messed this up. Let's try this again. Um, oh, God. Where is my... Sorry, you're going to have to edit this out, but I can't find where my screen sharing is now. Um, press the escape okay, key. Okay, got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah bring yep, up sorry, sorry about that. Um, so let's, let's, we'll try this from the, from the, the beginning again. Um, all right, so here is a session that I've got, and I've got a little bit of video in here. Um, and you'll see over here that, um, if, and hopefully, let me go, let me know if you guys can hear this. You all can see how the fans are. Mm -hmm. Did you guys hear that? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. So, so if you take a look at this this one word, um, you can see that it doesn't match this guy's mouth. You all can see how the fans are. So the the beginning's fine. Mm -hmm. you all can see how the That's fine. But instead of saying the odds seem out of favor. He says the odd seem out of favor. Okay, now in, in ADR, sometimes you know you'll miss things like this. Sometimes the the talent is gone and you can't get them back in. So Elastic Audio can come in to come to the rescue here. So I'm going to go here for I'll go to Polyphonic again because it's just a, an easy um, and effective way to to get going. I'm going to change over here to Warp View. I don't care in this particular case about uh, dealing with my you know and and. and pruning my um, event markers so much because I'm not quantizing to anything, right? Mm. But I do know that if you can see here, you can see it's it's marking the transients. The okay, so there's Fe and there's Ver. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm gonna take this guy and this is my this is my pin. This is my anchor. I'm gonna take this guy and this is my handle. And the great thing about this is that if I, as I drag, you can actually, it's, it, it will scrub the video. Mm -hmm. So if I go over here, I can go, I usually go too far and then I'll go until where he starts to drop his jaw. I went too far. There. Let's see how I did. You all can see how the fans 
Nails. So, and that's, it's, it's such a quick way to get stuff done that used to take us forever to do with the TC trim tool. And man, there's, there used to be a lot of drama around all this stuff, but there you go. It's like one more time. And, and as long as you understand how these event markers and warp markers can either be anchors mm -hmm. or handles, then, you know, there's, there's a, there's a lot more than you can, that you can do to this than Avid ever had in mind initially. Yeah. Fantastic workflow, Andy. And uh, one thing I need, I need to, uh, to point out at this uh, stage here is like I, I'm teaching a lot of Pro Tools courses. And this, of course, there's there's a large chapter in the Pro Tools 110 course about Elastic Audio. And it's just so interesting that every course, when I say, OK, this is the Elastic Audio chapter prepared for a heavy hit in the face, because it's, it's a, a very, very dense chapter with a lot of, of stuff and there's always someone saying yeah elastic audio is shit it, it just sounds awful and that's the standard in every course i teach there's someone always saying yeah it's shit and i say okay so um uh let's let's do the exercise and, <laughs> and let's <laughs> let's walk through this because if 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 you can't make elastic audio sound well uh, there are pro there's probably uh something that you're doing wrong mm -hmm. like not editing out uh, false transients and stuff like that mm -hmm. of course if you over overdo it it might sound shit uh, or will sound shit if you're trying but to do it too quickly it will because you, yeah you know, as, you, as we saw at the beginning it it, it it detects way more than it needs to and completely it, as lo if a if an event marker exists pro tools is going to try and quantize it if you're quantizing it's going to try and quantize it to the nearest grid line and, yeah. and it's it's infuriating, right? It was, by the way, when I when when this was in beta and I was playing around with it without knowing, you know, what I know now, um, I was I was quantizing, and the beginning of the notes would be right on, but as the tail would go on, it would just it would gurgle because yeah, yeah. there's all these little event markers that are just these these meaningless transients mm. that it that Pro Tools is trying to quantize to the nearest sixteenth note or whatever, and and it's doing what you told it to do, mm -hmm. but it's it you know it, it just needed a little bit more attention now is it is it completely automatic no no nope. it, it does it does uh demand some tending but if you understand the basic rules mm. there's a lot more you can do with elastic audio than you can do with many other time stretching features I, I think I think the way to think about it is like w when you're quantizing MIDI if you played something it's not an automatic matic thing either you need to go in and massage the results somewhat at least if you're rule. playing as badly as me <laughs> it's a basic rule for anything you know nothing yeah. is nothing is automatic even though it's it says automatic nothing is truly automatic but it's got to be some element of, of human in there can we talk a bit about what might cause these false transients or or no transients uh, for, because that's the important yeah, thing idea. like what 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 would be a problematic source to begin with uh, i can let's do one each uh, i can start with like electric basses a five string electric bass that low b string it will flap so slowly that it might even <laughs> detect as 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 separate transients for every time it's flapping back and forth so that might cause you really big problems you, you might want to go in and edit there do you do you know um do you know vocal sizzle yeah yeah well sibilance. um vocal sizzle not sibilance but sizzle um and this is when um and you, you hear this in the news a lot where the ends of the words they'll go and in today's news we had a hurricane and and, and it's i can't do it because it's so against everything i believe in because it's so bad for your voice but you will hear at the ends of some the way that some people talk it'll just start to to gristle out right and i get a lot of depending upon the person's voice uh, i'll get a lot of 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 extraneous and unnecessary um transients that are detected you know their, their changes in velocity they're small changes but they're quick changes in velocity um at the ends of 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 spoken words um not sung but but definitely spoken words um in in those cases if it's if it's a person that has that voice sizzle dave you got anything that uh, that uh, where you need to take care um the only thing that i can think of is is maybe 
uh, at the end of acoustic guitar notes where a player's moving fingers. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you get that little squeak, maybe. That's um, great. Yeah. Yep. yep. Uh, you can even get these on cymbals that are start wobbling internally, and mm-hmm. you can get those in, in long cymbals, and we'll start quantizing the cymbal uh, mm-hmm. ringing out. Um, but you know, but by the way, just yeah. just so you're you're, I think all three of us are saying that our primary issue with event markers is not that there are too few it's that there are too many, too many. so it, but it there are, but there are occasions where there are too few what sometimes would, yeah when when can you get too few um it slurs um you know d- depending upon the musical phrase sometimes you know a mm-hmm. a change in pitch mm-hmm. um can be a, a glissando or portamento yeah. um and 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 you want to quantize that that new note but there's no real identifying mm-hmm. attack. attack transient to it of course but but i would say that you know 80 percent 90 percent of my event marker work is removing ones that i don't want mm. rather than adding ones mm. that i do want that that pro tools didn't originally see yeah and of course instruments that don't have a clear transient attack like if you're doing strings and stuff you mm-hmm. might not have that attack, depending yeah. on the way that you're that they're playing or a synthesizer or something that has a very slow attack that might cause a problem to for you as well string bends sometimes yeah like mm-hmm. like if somebody takes a guitar string and they want to bend it up a half pitch, maybe mm-hmm. that's a part of the of the note, right? Mm-hmm. So so they're bending from let's say you know one one pitch at the beginning of the bar and then on the next eighth note they're 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 bending it up a half step, right? That's a mm-hmm. that's a long bend, but it can happen. You want to quantize that? Well, there's probably not going to be a transient there, you know. So you're going to have to use your ears and and drag that event marker to where you want it to be where your ear tells you that it is mm-hmm. and then you quantize that and everything's fine it's no problem it just takes a little bit of extra work and and some listening yeah. yep. so the sound quality actually issue is a is a big thing because we can tweak the elastic audio plugins can't we mm-hmm. well that's certainly the polyphonic one um anders could you talk about the uh the, the window um, I think um, I think uh, Andy, you had something pre- prepared for the window, didn't you? No, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we don't prepare, <laughs> Dave. I thought you had something prepared for the window. I thought Andy, uh, uh, Andy <laughs> had something prepared for the window. <laughs> okay, let's uh, let's look for, at this. For 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 rhythmic, yes. For rhythmic, it's it's a thing. But but we're talking about about polyphonic and and um, and monophonic here. Oh no! Oh, you mean that right one? There. Okay, yes, yeah, that's okay. the one. Yeah, okay. Sorry, sorry, guys. Um, yeah. So the polyphonic plugin is a very special one because it's it's working like a granule synthesis. Mm-hmm. Uh, it basically takes uh, a small portion of the material that you're working on, and and it's granularly looping this to create. Uh, and uh, if you time stretch something, and and that window can be set by by the user in the plugin itself, and of course that plugin, if you click on the word polyphonic, it will open up this. And these are the uh, sizes of the slices that it chops it up into, isn't that's it? That's right. Yeah, exactly the sizes of the slices. Uh, so I can adjust that here, and it also has a little follow button here, and that follow button turns on uh, is that the for format relationship in yeah, yeah so it, it's comparing to the original audio file isn't it so it's kind yeah, of sticking right. them on top of each other and, and trying to keep them as yeah. as close as possible well, and uh, and format follow really only comes into play when you're when you're changing pitch yeah um, so as as long as you're not changing pitch which mm-hmm. we can do with elastic audio as well mm-hmm. uh, but as as long as you you don't you don't need to turn this on but you can experiment with this uh, window how big a chunks uh, you want to have uh, a, a little bit to to see if that uh, sounds better to your ears you know to to me um mm-hmm. having a smaller window will sound every once in a while a little bit sandy um and if it doesn't you know if i want to kind of smooth it out and and kind of you know, gauze over it. Having a bigger window will work that way. Now, it won't be as temporarily act- accurate. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when you when you quantize things and when you, especially when you quantize, but dragging obviously is is mm-hmm. you use your ears for that. But um, a larger window to me, if if you ever find that it just sounds a little, a little brittle, um, 
taking that window and making it a little bit longer can can sometimes smooth things out a little bit. Mm. Uh, I've got a couple of notes from from the three ten book here in yeah, terms the, of which suggested window lengths. Um, oh. Kind of the general purpose stuff, uh, like a catch. I mean, Polyphonic is a catch-all plugin. I think we refer to it as that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. In terms of catch-all settings between 30 and 40 milliseconds, window length of 30, 40 milliseconds. Um, yeah. Pads and legato stuff, 60 milliseconds or higher. So the, 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 the granular sizes are larger. The loops are larger. And then for, for percussive things, um, 20 milliseconds and below. Yeah, yeah, that's those are those are good starting off points, right? Mm -hmm. I think everything you know, you let your ears be your guide, but those are good, good solid recommendations. Uh, a couple of more things that you might end up with is, um, is also I've opened the Elastic Properties window here, which um, um, uh, which shows a, a bit of interesting information about this clip and this comes in two versions one version uh, the one that we're looking at right now is if your if your track is a tick based track and if you move over to sample based track that window looks slightly different but mm -hmm. that's not exactly what i wanted to show this uh, but if you time stretch stuff and especially if you compress stuff in time you might get transients pushed together making nice. the 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 sound louder than it mm -hmm. actually is. Mm -hmm. So you might end up clipping the the wave file itself. Yep. So that's why you have the input gain po possibility here to turn down the input gain. It's like applying um, applying clip a gain. clip yeah. gain, but uh, it's even before the clip gain. If I'm uh, if I understand this correctly, because this is actually before the clip gain stage mm. so you're turning down the volume slightly so you don't clip if you have compressed the audio yeah usually you're not going to run into this it's rare that you run into this unless you have something that comes to you that's already normalized or close to it right yeah um yeah, yeah. and what I've basically never, i've I, never had this myself, i have by I, the way. i've had a couple of times and it's always yeah. been with like drum loops and stuff like okay, that yeah it's always been with drum loops that have been smashed, right? You know, that, yeah. that are that are normalized. And it always happens, and I don't think it can only happen, but it always, in my case, has always, always happened when I compress the time. Yeah, exactly. And what happens is it causes for, for inter-sample peaking that didn't previously exist, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's one good thing to, to know about, that you can gain down at, at this stage. This happens we should too. also talk about pitch change on the next show as well when we talk about more advanced workflows with um with with this pitch pitch band or pitch band pitch shifting with with elastic audio something we could do um mm -hmm. do me a quick favor andrews mm -hmm. um go ahead and change your algorithm to monophonic yeah sure monophonic so monophonic you notice that it, it'll it'll flash real quickly it changes the algorithm changes the plugin basically mm. and if you click the word monophonic it's going to give you a similar window but nothing's going to be in it right mm -hmm. so monophonic doesn't have the the same parameters because the algorithm doesn't need it um doesn't have the same quite uh, parameters uh for the audio for the for the plugin that polyphonic does and rhythmic's different we'll talk about that and, and x form and all that are all different we'll talk about that apparently on the next show right yeah. yeah, indeed. So, so what, when would you use the monophonic plugin, Dave? You know what? Uh, I mean, if you're just asking, um, <laughs> I, I do a lot of um, of arranging where I have individual tracks. So, so for example, you know, if I've got horn tracks, I do a lot of, mm -hmm. of, of you know, virtual instruments and, you know, for like trumpets and real, real instruments, but virtualized. And I will find that I get noticeably better results. Um, uh, in many cases, not all, but many cases, I'll have it on polyphonic and I'll be, oh, that sounds fine. And I'm like, well, what the heck? Just real quickly, let's change it over to monophonic. It's clearly better, right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, only only in single notes, you know, anytime you, you have, um, you know, chords or any kind of polyphony, then it doesn't, you know, it, it'll sound okay, but it won't sound as good as polyphonic. Mm. Totally, in my opinion as well. Uh, electric bass, uh, singers, of course, uh, also dialogue, uh, mm -hmm. uh, monophonic uh, plugins, and uh, I think the plugin is designed also to to keep the formant relationships yes. intact. And formants is. is, of course, the the tiny little details in in your voice that make your voice sound 
like your voice. So it, 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 it does a better job of preserving those little uh, overtones uh, that are, are, are needed. I'm going to say that. something heretical, yeah. but the, the, common, the common wisdom is that X form is the best. And I'll challenge that because I have gone through a bunch of tracks and I'll, I'll go through all of them and I'll go back to monophonic. It'll actually sound better than X form in many cases. In many cases, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, but as you say, uh, we haven't really mentioned X form, but uh, when we get we'll, to it, we'll talk we'll, about that next. Yeah, we'll talk it. talk about that then. <laughs> so, so there's a couple of things to to point out from Anders' last statement. The first of which, or, or possibly Andy, is that we switch. We can switch between the Elastic Audio plugins to audition yep. the different plugins, mm -hmm. and it doesn't make any changes, does it? Well, you will hear an audible change, but you will not see any change, and, and it's non-destructive. I, I um, mean, yeah. I mean, editing. Yeah. You know, any editing that you've done, you can switch between the plugins to see yeah. what happens. Yeah, completely. Uh, and yeah. as long and as we are talking right now, I mean, we're doing all of these plugins that we're talking about are actually real-time processors right now, as we can see here. Right, real-time processing is turned on, mm -hmm. so it's um, good to know that that these you can switch them and and, and take a listen to to what one you prefer sonically mm -hmm. and uh, and once you've decided on one you can you can render the the tracks the content mm -hmm. as well yeah the the other thing is that it prever it traverses it preserves the pitch it does so polyphonic monophonic modes you can make all of these changes the pitch is going to be completely unaffected i'll do you one better um you know, some people might go, okay, well, I can I can use this, but I can just go ahead and use the TCE trim tool. Mm. The TCE trim tool, when Elastic Audio is turned off, the TCE trim tool is a is an audio basically is an audio suite plugin. Mm -hmm. So when you drag something, for example, it creates a new file, mm -hmm. and then if and then if you're like, oh no, I didn't do that quite right, and you and you drag it again, mm -hmm. it's processing the processed mm -hmm. file. And, and I see a lot of people that have used the TC trim tool again and again, trying to get it perfectly, and they'll keep on TC, 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 TC. Yep. And they, at some point, the audio quality just takes a complete yep. nosedive. It's similar right? to recording from tape to tape to tape to tape to tape to tape. Yeah, and it'll sound yeah, okay, yeah. okay, 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 and then kind of <laughs> terrible, and then <laughs> completely un unrecognizable. The nice thing about this is that, A, when you're when you're using elastic audio it's it's operating upon the first generation file all the time mm -hmm. and if you want and when elastic audio is on if you want to use the tce trim tool it's not using that audio suite process mm -hmm. it's it's using the elastic audio process so if you go ahead and use the tce trim tool now yeah. go ahead and stretch that out notice that there's no rendering going on Right? Why? Because it's not hooking into what it would otherwise hook into, and you can go ahead and just you know stretch mm -hmm. that for days and days and days, and it will never degrade the quality as a result of processing a processed process. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, it's really well thought and, and it's performed in real time. Yeah, it's performed in real time, and it's acting upon the original file uh, in so all I, cases. Are are these plugins like taxing your computer a lot? I mean, are they CPU heavy? These plugins, they can be if you have enough tracks on. Um, I mean, it's it, individually they're not right, mm -hmm. but but if you have a lot of different tracks, then then they can be. Um, now there's a there's a preference that you should be aware of if you want to, and if you should be aware of if you don't. Mm -hmm. So if you go to, I believe it is processing. Mm -hmm. Um, and I believe, where the heck is it? Oh, top, Elastic top, Audio. Top, so top in Elastic right, Audio, yeah. um, ela enable Elastic Audio on new tracks. Um, if you if you are, are a musician that's using Elastic Audio a lot, that can mm -hmm. be a convenience, but it could also kill you because Elastic Audio on a whole bunch of different tracks running in, running natively, mm -hmm. um, not not file based, not rendered, but 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 running real time. If you have enough tracks, it can it can impact your system. Do you know that that's a setting that I recommend a lot of uh, electronic music producers use because it's it's quite easy to forget. I think that audio and media are, are different. So al always having an Elastic Audio mode and and in tick based as well if you're working on e electronic mm -hmm. stuff a lot of midi and only a small amount of audio making sure that all of that is always connected to each other just having that on 
it's, sure. And 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 next time thing. we'll talk about changing, you know, individual tracks when you're done from mm. real time to rendered processing, which is going to you know take that load off of your CPU. But that's a topic yeah. for another day. Yeah. Is there anything else to mention with monophonic? Because the, the the editing process is the same. It, it's mm -hmm. just the the processing is ever so slightly different, and the application is ever so slightly different. But yep, yeah. There is one more thing, but I, I think uh, we're going to save pitch transposition with Elastic Audio for next time. Mm -hmm. But you can't do pitch transposition with Elastic Audio on a monophonic plugin. That's correct. Track. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it has to be polished. Yeah. Uh, if you want to know more about pitch transposition with Elastic Audio, you should definitely watch the next video next week. Yeah, I, I would say that the other thing, and this is true of all the different um, algorithms, is they all have different kind of design tolerances. So, mm -hmm. Dave, as you were stretching and, and compressing and it turns red, it'll turn red at different points, uh, mm -hmm. which it, it's it's I, useful to know, but it's not necessarily ground shaking. Again, always let your ears be your guide. I've got mm -hmm. I've had tracks with red little areas and and if it's you know not a big deal there you go so now you've gone so so in monophonic you're you're stretching it way out and it's not yeah. turning red yet yeah right and if you go to polyphonic it might be different let's find out whoa can't or get it, it together <laughs> or it might be exactly the same interesting yeah seems to be about the same length here somewhere so let me just switch that to monophonic oh. again <clears throat> okay so i i wanted to finish off with one topic that might set the internet on fire oh boy uh, yeah <laughs> uh, but i'm <laughs> interested you possibly go wrong? but i'm in, but i'm interested in in your opinion so you know elastic audio is all about warping audio samples isn't it so to my mind the more samples that you have in the signal the better the 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 the, 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 the more integrity that the audio is going to have when you're warping it so mm -hmm. one of the advices from uh, from the avid course was to record at 32 bit you're going to get a better stretch um, a better audio integrity if you record at 32 bit float um, and I'd also add in that if you're recording at some of the higher sample rates as well, that would also maintain some of the audio integrity too. Am I right? I've heard the sample rate part. I haven't heard about the bit depths affecting it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, they, remember the 32-bit audio has, has a 24-bit Mantis anyways. Yes. Um, so it, it's not that different um, from 24-bit audio. Mm. Um, but but certainly, um, if you if you feel like you're going to have uh, a session that that you're going to be stretching or compressing, mm. especially stretching. Um, I I will I you know it's just another reason why I generally record at 96. Yes, exactly the same. And same thing. I I re uh, recommend that all of my students record at 20 at least 24 bit, uh, and maybe at least 90 mm. 96. And that there are a couple of other reasons as well. None of them yes. to do necessarily with with what you hear, <laughs> which is always the argument when you bring up uh, sample rates. Is well, I can't hear any difference. Isn't well, you know, that's not always the reason. Um, but I, I think a lot of uh, today, um, a maybe a majority of sessions, maybe I'm painting with a very broad brush, but a majority of sessions are going to include some element of time stretching, whether or, or sample stretching, whether it be pitch or whether it be quantizing. The, and, and sample rate selection and bit depth selection is all about adding more samples in on the X and Y axes, right? And, and giving more data into the sample. So if, to my mind, if you've got more data in those in that sample capture, you're, you're going to have, you're going to be able to maintain the integrity of your audio um, for longer. Let's let so the internet, true. Let's just yeah, let the internet explode there. But the, the, <laughs> and also the 32-bit floating point is something that is in both of the expert courses. Uh, mm. So it's um, it's coming directly from the source, directly from Avid. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll just leave that there. We'll let you guys argue that in the comments. <laughs> but uh, I, I, as long as Andy's not disagreeing, as long as Anders isn't disagreeing, that that's the point of having three of us here. I think we can we can make statements, and you know I've, we've got two ridiculously clever experts um, who can who are welcome to disagree at any point. What um, are they coming on the next show? 
Um, yeah, they're, <laughs> exactly. they're, they're on the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so next in the next episode, we're going to delve into very speed and rhythmic. And I, we've been going for a long time now. X form uh, and X form. This is this is certainly turned into a show longer than I was expecting it to. So it may even <laughs> stretch out into three. We'll see where things go. Um, but all it leads me to say is make sure you guys join us in the next episode. Um, thank you very much to Anders. Thank you. Thank you very much to Andy. You bet. My name is Dave. This is Pro Tools Answers. We'll see you next time. And we're out. <laughs> <laughs>